Welcome, everyone, uh, to the IPy widgets tutorial that we have this morning. Uh, we'll be going for about four hours uh, until about noon. Uh, to start off, we'll do a short introduction. I'm Jason Grout. I've been working on uh, IPy widgets since it was uh, started a couple of years ago, and uh, and I'll be doing the first part of the tutorial. My name is Matt Craig. I teach physics and astronomy at Minnesota State University, Moorhead. Um, I'd started working with widgets about five years ago at the first IPython tutorial here at SciPy, um, and have really pursued that since then for working with um, undergraduates, um, making it easy for them to use professional software um, without having to learn any programming. I'm Martin Renou. Um, I work at Quantstack in Paris. I've been working on uh, uh, widgets uh, libraries since uh, more than a year now. And, uh, uh, my name is uh, Martin Bredos. I, um, I have an astronomy background where I started co uh, contributing to um, uh, IPA widgets. Uh, now I'm a freelancer consulting, working, uh, consultant working on um, uh, widget development, a lot of that with, uh, together with Quantstack. Uh, and I'm also a core contributor of Voila, which we'll demonstrate in the, uh, the end. And uh, I hope it's going to be a, a, a useful day. Yeah. Great. Um, so a few logistic details. Uh, the four of us will be available to help answer questions. Uh, even while we're talking and, and the presentation's going on, feel free to raise your hands. Uh, Matt's in the back, and, and these guys will keep a, a monitor of who has their hand raised. Uh, if you have installation issues, or if you have issues running uh, the code, or you have a question about things, feel free to raise your hand and have a whispered conversation, uh, even while the presentation's going. And there'll be plenty of exercises and plenty of breaks where we can have a, a conversation up here as well. Um, we also invite you to uh, pull a fresh version of the uh, materials. We've, we've got some updates from this morning. Uh, so go ahead and do a git pull uh, on the repository and you'll get uh, the latest materials here. And, and I mentioned I'm Jason Grout. I work at uh, Bloomberg. So the basic uh, outline of what we'll do is a brief introduction to how to think about widgets and some of the core widgets that come with the IPy widgets package itself. Um, we'll talk about uh, the core widgets and we'll talk about how to lay out widgets. Uh, to, to create dashboard-like applications or web applications. Uh, and then we'll go into quite a few uh, third-party uh, widget libraries, uh, including plotting, uh, uh, spreadsheet widgets, et cetera, uh, that, that, you really, that really show the power of, of IPy widgets and the, and the framework that's built up here. And then we'll wrap up things by showing you how you can publish your widget applications outside of the notebook uh, on the web. So. Uh, let, with that, let's, oh, and then there's one other thing, and that is uh, there is a Slack channel uh, associated with this. Uh, there's a Gitter channel that most of us are on if you, if you want to contact us outside of this tutorial. Uh, during the tutorial, we'll be monitoring the Slack channel. Um, for, for our setup that you see up here, we'll be using IPy widget 7.5, which was released uh, about a week or two ago and JupyterLab 1.0.1, uh, which was also released about a week or two ago. Um, but most of the notebooks should work with IPy widget 7.4 if you, if you installed and set up your environment from, uh, from more than a few weeks ago. Um, and then finally, uh, if you have installation issues, we encourage you to follow the installation instructions and install it in a fresh Conda environment. Uh, a lot of times we've seen people have installation issues when you try to install it into a current Conda environment with possibly older versions of packages or conflicting versions of packages, et cetera. So if you're, if you're having some installation issues, we encourage you to start with a fresh Conda environment from the, from the readme of the installation instructions. So with that, uh, let's uh, go right into uh, what IPy widgets is. And one of the ways to illustrate the power that you get with IPy widgets is to think about what you do as you iterate through code. Jupyter is about interactive code uh, exploration. And uh, we'll do a really simple example that's sort of a, a silly play example, but gets the point across. Uh, suppose you wanted to explore the square function. And so you might say, I have this function. I want to figure out how to work with it. I want to interactively play with it. Like I might do like 9 times 9. Okay, that's 81, and then I might change my code to be 10 times 10, 100, change my code again to be 11 times 11. And, you know, this gets pretty boring pretty quickly, but it does typify some of the workflow that we start out with, where we have some code in a cell and we keep modifying the code and playing with it and rerunning it and rerunning it. 
And so the first level of abstraction is to say, well, I don't want to type in my code every time. And so I create a function like f of x. And I print x times x. And then it becomes much easier to modify things and play with things. Uh, you know, f of 9 is 81. Then I'll have to change one number instead of two numbers. It's 100. If I do f of 10, f of 11. And so it becomes a little bit more fluid, a little bit more interactive uh, playing with my code. And so the purpose of IPy widgets, if, if you think about what you're doing with your code, here's you. You're typing in code to into the Jupyter Notebook and asking a Jupyter Notebook to execute the code in the kernel. And then the kernel, in this case Python, is executing the code and sending some output back to the Jupyter Notebook and then it's displaying back to you. And in this workflow that we've seen, essentially the, the slowest thing in this, in this, uh, this uh, diagram is you. And in particular, the frustrating thing is the slow thing is like physically typing in the code. And so if we can speed up that, uh, then it lets you sort of think about things and, and more fluidly interact with things. And if we can speed that up, uh, it lets you uh, uh, sort of stay out of the typing level and, and on the thought plane. So here's what IPy widgets can do. So I'm going to import everything from IPy widgets, and I'm going to use the IPy widgets interact function. And now, instead of running the function and manually changing the inputs, uh, all, I can, all I have to do is move the slider. And as I move the slider, every time the slider changes, i make this a little bit bigger. Can you read this in the back? Especially if I scroll it up to the top. Okay, great. Um, so what IPy Widgets is doing here is it's giving me a, a nice GUI control of slider. And as I change the slider, it's changing the input to the F, to the function and automatically printing the output. And so now I can scroll through input and output uh, of this function just very, very smoothly. And you can see sort of in this diagram up here, now this loop, this interactive loop as I play with the computation is now sort of speeding along as fast as I can think. And I don't have to like jump out of a thought process and down to, okay, what, what variables do I need to type in? What code do I need to type in? Then back up to, okay, what does that mean? And how do I interpret this? And how do I change my code? I can stay at the thought level and, and really sort of uh, work as fast as I can think. And that's the power of IPy widgets is making this interactive loop much more fluid, much more interactive, and much simpler for not only you, but other people you may work with that aren't as comfortable uh, actually editing the code. So, interactive uh, Jupyter widgets. Uh, we have a number of sort of these widgets, these GUI controls that you have here. And uh, so for example, here's a, a float slider, uh, represents a floating point number. And one thing you'll notice is uh, that uh, the same control can be displayed multiple different times. And each of these controls is just a view on the same underlying abstract concept here the concept of this one floating point number. And so as I change one view of this number, the, of course, all the other views update as well. Um, each widget here has uh, a number of values. For example, the uh, number of properties, like the value property. Uh, this value property is the actual value that your slider is set at. And it's not just showing you what the slider is set at, but it also lets you do uh, the reverse, which is set the value. So here I'm going to set the slider's value to 8. And this is, again, one of the things that the IPy widgets allows you to do is uh, two-way communication with values in your code. Um, you can also trigger any ch uh, actions uh, when something changes. And we're going to go into these a lot more in, de uh, a lot more in detail later on, um, but as an example. Here I have, uh, let's see, square is the slider value times the slider value. And what this means is every time the slider changes, I'm going to run this function, and I'm going to set square to be uh, the new slider value. And so you can see square is 64. But as I change this value, square is being updated. So if I ask again what the square value is, it's updated to 6.4 uh, squared. And so the key here is as the user's interacting with this control, you can run arbitrary code in the background, updating things, running new computations based on whatever the user's doing in this, in this GUI control. And then lastly, and again, we'll go into these in more detail uh, throughout the tutorial, um, it's easy to link two controls together. So here I have a, a slider, 
and the slider from before, and a text box that displays a number. And I've done one line right here, this link line, that says take the slider's value and make it the same as the text box value. So if I change the slider, it updates the text box. If I change the text box, it updates the slider. Uh, the slider's minimum value was uh, five, so it updated it within its constraints. But you can see as I change the text box, it's updating the slider. And so it's very easy to have controls that influence other controls. Um, and you'll see one other thing here, and that is not only do we have controls, but we have uh, widgets that are laying out controls. So you can build up entire uh, complicated GUIs. Um, one way to think about IPy widgets is these actual controls that you see, the sliders and checkboxes and text boxes and things like that. But the more powerful way to think about widgets is as a framework. Um, think about it as a framework for enabling sort of interactive computation between something in the browser, some GUI control in the browser, and some uh, value in the Python and the kernel. And using this framework, uh, a number of third-party widgets have been built, and it's very easy. They, they more come online uh, 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 daily, weekly, monthly. Um, so for example, we have a 2D plotting library, a 3D plotting library, interactive maps, uh, videos, and we'll have some demos of these sorts of widgets uh, later on in the tutorial. All right, let's stop here for uh, questions on uh, sort of the overview of IPy widgets. Let's take a quick poll. How many people have used IPy widgets before now? How many people have heard of IPy widgets? Okay. And how many people like have a friend that's used them? Okay, <laughs> great. Um, so you saw a few people here. You can turn to them and ask them questions as well if you saw their hand up when they saying they use them. All right, so let's go a little bit more into depth about how to think about IPy widgets. And this sets up sort of a framework of uh, how to understand what you're doing when you do IPy widgets. Um, <clears throat> so uh, there's a, a, a number of different third-party libraries. Um, but uh, here's, here's an example of a more complicated thing that can be controlled with IPy widgets. So if you want a vision of like the sorts of things that you can do with IPy widgets. In fact, what we have here is a, a number of different IPy widgets, uh, third-party widgets plus the core controls uh, combined here in, in, a, in a, a complicated layout. Here we have a 3D plotting uh, uh, section, a 2D plotting section, a number of sliders, uh, a play and pause button that controls this slider and lets you animate across parameters, uh, a number of text boxes and sliders, et cetera. So um, you can do quite complicated things uh, with the IPy widgets. All right, so let's dive into uh, using that interact control. The, so I showed in, in the first example, and this is sort of a, a an overview of, of the first part of this tutorial. Uh, first we have the interact, which is a very easy way to take a function and quickly put up some automated controls for, for the parameters of the function. Uh, and then we'll go into more detail about actual individual controls if you want to have more control about what the controls are. So let's look at the interacts. Okay, so the idea behind the IPy widgets interact function is we want to automatically create a GUI for a function. Uh, we introspect the function, look at the parameters of the function, and try to guess what would be good GUI controls, what would be, you know, whether it's sliders or checkboxes and things like this. And so here we have a, uh, an example function. It's, we're going to do three times whatever the input is. And Python allows us the input to be a number of different types of things, right? If this input is a string, it'll concatenate the th string three times. If it's a number, it'll multiply the number by three. And so we want to generate some GUI controls for this function, and we have to give uh, we have to give uh, IPy widgets the interact function uh, a clue about what kind of GUI control is appropriate for the parameters we expect. And so we can do interact. Uh, that's the function from that's the function from IPy widgets. Here's the function that I'm introspecting, and here are the parameters that I want to create controls for. And if I just say x equals 10, then IPy widgets tries to guess, oh, you've got a number. You probably want something that gives you inputs of numbers. And so we default to uh, a slider that is integer, uh, integer values. And again, the, the point behind this GUI 
control uh, that you have here is every time you move the slider, it's going to call the function and print out the result from the function. Um, if you tell IPy widgets, oh, that parameter it should default to true, then IPy widgets guesses, oh, you mean a Boolean parameter, and so a control for that would be a checkbox. And so here's a checkbox. Uh, Python is interpreting that true or false value as one or zero when you multiply uh, by three. And so what you end up having is when, the, when false is passed into the function, uh, zero times three, and when true is passed into the function, one times three. If you tell IPy widgets that parameter is a string, the default value is a string, then IPy widgets guesses, okay, you want strings, so I should put a text box there. And here, as I type into the text box, you can see uh, it's automatically rerunning the function and printing out three times whatever the input is, which in Python means concatenate the input three times when you have a string. Question? So what's the purpose of the semicolon at the end of this? Right here? Yeah, let's, let's, let's do it without the semicolon. And you'll notice what happens is uh, we get an output from running this cell. And the output from running this cell is this function. So, um, it, so what we'll see is, in the next example, why we get the function back when we run interact. Um, the semicolon is to suppress the printing of the output of that. It, it's to suppress the printing of the last statement in that notebook cell which is this function object. And the reason why we give a function object is because we can also use this interact as a decorator. And so using interact as a decorator, now it takes in a function and gives back a function. And that's what we were seeing before. Um, so if you want to just define a function and create the GUI controls for it in one step, you can use interact as a decorator. Here's my parameters. Uh, X is gonna be a Boolean, which means we'll get a checkbox. Uh, y is the float value, which means we'll get a a float slider, and if we run this, you'll see uh, a checkbox and the float slider. Here the function is just returning the tuple of the, of the two arguments, and, uh, and g is still defined here. Uh, uh, let's see, false. So g is still defined, and that's the output that we were seeing up above is output of interact as a function. So you have the GUI controls, but G is still also defined. <coughs> Great question. Other questions about, yes? Sorry, cell three, how does it know the default size and end value? Ah, great question. Let's, uh, let's scroll down here to looking at uh, how IPy widgets tries to guess what kind of control that you have and how you can modify it. So if you pass an integer value, uh, it generates an integer valued slide control, and the default here, uh, I guess, is negative 10 to three times uh, 10. So we try to pick some reasonable parameter values. Uh, obviously, those won't always be correct. In fact, a lot of times they may not be correct. Um, and so it's very easy for you to, uh, to, instead of giving just a single value, to give a range of values. Here's a, here's a, a table of how IPy widgets tries to guess. Uh, if you give, for example, a true or false, it gives you a checkbox. If you give a single value, or a tuple min to max, or a three a tuple min max and a step value, then it constructs a slider, and that's a very easy way for you to uh, say a minimum and a maximum value, uh, and to give better clues. So for example, if we go up to the very top, where you said, uh, we said x equals 10, and instead we say, well, no, my parameter value goes from 0 to 100, then IPy widgets interprets that as the slider should go from 0 to 100. And the same thing for floats here. If you give a value a min, or a, or a min-max tuple or min-max step tuple, uh, but they're floats, then it'll give you a float slider. If you give it a list of items, it'll give you a drop-down, so you can select one of the items. And so that's a way to, to signify to IPy widgets uh, the sort of control that it should construct. If one of these abbreviations or one of these shortcuts for creating controls isn't what you want, then you can actually give it an exact control. So here we interact with F, 
and we're gonna say x is an actual int slider, and here's the minimum, here's the maximum, here's the step for that function, and here's the default value, and we actually just create that, that exact control for you and give, that, give the result. Um, well, we, we skipped one section, I'll just mention, uh, if you have a function and you want to just create a GUI for a single parameter or some of the parameters but not other parameters, you can fix a parameter um, by using the IPyWidgets fixed uh, command. So here I have a function that takes two arguments. I want a control, slider control for one argument, and the other argument I just want to fix at 20. And so here we have uh, a slider control for P, but Q is always fixed at 20. So this is like the partial uh, in the func Python func tools, if you're familiar with that. All right. Um, so here's some more examples of more complicated uh, abbreviations that IPyWidgets can guess uh, the GUI control. So here we have a minimum and a maximum uh, slider, zero to four. Here we have a minimum and a maximum and a step that's a float value. So this is a float slider now, gives you float values. Um, and you can do the same sort of thing with uh, the interacts, uh, of, with the decorator uh, version of interact. And here, notice that we try to be smart about the default value as well. So if your function has a default value, here x is 5.5, we take that as the default value of the control. Uh, drop down menus, like I mentioned, were, are constructed by giving a list of things. So here are apples or oranges. And if you want a drop-down menu where you have a Python value, but you want to control what's printed to the user here, uh, you can specify a list of tuples, the first item being a label, the second item being the value that's going to be passed into the function. So in this case, what the user sees is the labels one or two, and when they select one or two, then the corresponding value 10 or 20 is passed into the function. One is 10 times, you know, gives you the output of 10 times three, uh, two gives you the output of 20 times three. So you really have quite a bit of flexibility without ever constructing a widget uh, to, to construct these GUIs for arbitrary functions and, uh, and be able to quickly play with these. All right, questions? Also, if you're having any installation issues, raise your hand. Yep, any installation issues, raise your hand. Matt's here and Martin and Martin, Martin uh, can help out as well. All right, so that's the interact function. That's probably most people's first step uh, in using IPy widgets. It's certainly my first thing that I reach for when I'm just trying to play with a function or, or, or play with interactive controls. Uh, we have some more powerful variants of this function, like interactive. Um, and the idea behind interactive uh, is that it lets you pull things apart a little bit and, and do a little bit more customization of this GUI that is constructed for this function. Uh, so, for example, here's a, a function. It's going to display uh, using the IPython display function, uh, the sum, and then also return that sum. And uh, we're going to go ahead and uh, call this interactive function, which is just like interact. It creates the GUI controls, but it doesn't just automatically display them. It returns instead this entire GUI for you to take apart or re restructure however you want. So this W that it returns is a widget itself. You can see that here. And uh, it has a children attribute. And the children attribute gives you actually the, the three things that are going to be in this GUI. Uh, a slider for the first parameter. That's the A parameter. A slider for the second parameter, the B parameter. And then that output of whatever the function output is. But you can, you can play with this. Uh, you can display it, for example, and then it looks like the normal interact. Um, but you can also uh, look at the keyword arguments for any particular invocation. So I'm gonna change the slider value and this widget keeps track of whatever the current invocation is, uh, the current parameter values. And here's the current result of the function. So we can play with it a little bit there. Or we can do something like uh, w dot w dot children zero. So this is the int slider, just the int slider, and I can even say w dot children dot zero dot value equals uh, thirty. And now you'll notice that now that first slider is thirty. 
So I can take out just those controls and I can play with them programmatically with the interactive function. Um, so we've see, just seen some basic outputs like printing, but we can do, of course, more complicated things. Uh, for example, one thing you might want to do is print out a plot or display a plot. So here we uh, are displaying, here's a function that uh, we can actually run the function so you can see uh, what this function does is it just uh, displays, uh, uh, what does it display? A, a line with the slope and the, and the intercept. And so if I use interactive, and then I just, uh, here I use interactive to get the widget controls, and then, I, and then I display those widget controls, and I got something a little more complicated than just displaying uh, uh, the, the text of an output. I can actually display a map plot of the plot, um, and you can really just display anything you want here. Uh, images, videos, figures, whatever. Um, sometimes what you'll see is that functions run a long time. And so having a function that updates, having a function that updates every time you drag the slider one notch over uh, can really drag things down. And so you may want to disable these continuous updates so that uh, the update only happens when you finish dragging a slider or you adjust all the parameters and then you say go and then the function runs. And that's very easy to do with the interact manual function. So here's a slow function because we sleep and we use the interact manual function here. And what it does is essentially instead of calling the function every time the uh, GUI control changes, uh, it waits until you actually press this run interact button. And then it runs the function which sleeps and then prints out uh, the value in this case. But if you have a long running function that's a, a long complicated computation, you might want to do something like this where all your controls are set up and then you press the button and then it runs that single run of the function. Um, you can get at this uh, manual button uh, another way by using this uh, dictionary argument in interactive itself. So this is an equivalent invocation here where I can change this parameter however much I want. It doesn't actually do anything until I actually press the button. Um, if you're just dealing with sliders, you have another option as well, and that is the continuous update uh, uh, attribute to sliders. So here I'm using interact. I have my slow function that I'm creating a GUI for, and the parameter I'm going to explicitly say, make it a float slider. Don't try to guess what to do. Here's exactly the control I want you to use. And in this float slider, I say continuous update equals false. So what this does is instead of in, interact manual would put a button there that would I have to press in order to run the function. What this does is it constructs a float slider uh, that doesn't run until I take my until I take the mouse off the slider. So you'll see here I drag the slider around and the function's not running. And then when I let go of the slider, then the function runs. And sometimes that's a little more fluid than waiting for a button to press, um, a little bit uh, nicer interaction. And then finally, uh, uh, let's look at the interactive output. And each of these is sort of stepping one level deeper into being able to customize this interact uh, GUI that's being uh, created. And so what interactive output does is it lets you create the controls all the controls you want, lay them out however you want. So here I create three int sliders, and I'm going to lay them out in an H box, which means put them side by side horizontally. And then I have a function that's just going to print the, print the uh, outputs here, uh, print the inputs. And then I'm going to use this interactive output. And what this does is it just constructs that one output region. And so, and, and hooks it up to all the sliders here. So I'm going to create an out, I'm going to create a, something that, can, that captures the output of the function, and I'm just going to hook it up to these three sliders here. And then I'm going to display uh, this H box of the three sliders horizontally, and then this output region that I got. And so what we end up having is something that's a little bit more customized layout than what we would get with just interact. That, stacks these sliders vertically. Here I've constructed the three sliders manually and I've laid them out manually and then I just said, okay, give me an output region that's hooked up to these like Interact would do and then I'm going to uh, put that output region right below the sliders. So again, one more step towards being able to customize the GUI to be uh, something that you'd like. All right, so at this point, let's take a, take a, take a, a pause and we have uh, an example here that 
uh, you'll notice that up here, up here, um, sometimes, this, this plot is a pretty simple plot, but a more complicated plot would take a long time to update. And so sometimes, even this, if I drag the slider back and forth a lot, you'll notice the plot really kind of lags. And so take a second and try to write the code in this, in this cell down here, and we gave you an example, uh, that would uh, take that slider, and instead of updating as I drag, updating the plot as I drag, make that slider so that it only updates the plot after I let go of the slider. So here's the code for the first slider, the children zero slider. And now uh, go ahead and write the code for also making the second slider uh, update only when I lift off. Here's, the, you know, if I run the code that's given, you'll notice that now the first slider doesn't update the plot until I let go of the slider, but the second slider still updates the plot as I, as I move it. So go ahead and write the code that would also do the same thing for the second slider. Question. Oh, good question. Um, is there a way to change the text of this interact button? And the answer is yes. Um, <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, let's see. What, do you remember the <coughs> Matt Martin? Martin, do you remember the the argument for it? Just uh, uh, I don't. I don't. Yeah. There's an argument. Oh, let's see if we can look it up while people are writing that thing. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do interact. Make a question mark, and. Here's some examples. Uh, I'm forgetting right off the top of my head what the what the uh, let me look in the source code actually. Yeah. Is it is it description? Uh, I think it's uh, are are you sure it's description or is that a guess? I think it's not description. It's it's like it, let me look it up and and answer that. But yes, there is a way to change that text. I can't remember right off the top of my head what the argument is. All right, how many people have changed that second slider at this point? Okay, great. And so some of you probably just copied this code and, and did what? Change the zero to a one. Yep, we want the second widget as well. Index from zero, uh, index, index from zero, so the second widget is one. And now we have uh, the second slider as well, only updating when I let go. All right, so let's move to uh, a few uh, exercises uh, based on Interact. So this is a 2.01 uh, Interact exercises. Um, in the first one, we'll make an Interact for a function that reverses text. And in the second one, we'll make an Interact for a plot, like what we see here. Um, for some of the exercises, we have solutions. So please, of course, don't look at the solution until you try it and give it a good effort. Um, but you can look at the solution by uh, uncommenting this and then running the cell. Uh, th that will load the solution but not execute it. And then you can run the cell again to execute the, execute the solution. So uh, let's take a few minutes and uh, try the 2.01 Interact exercises. All right, so does everyone how many people have completed the, the two exercises? Okay, great. Um, I'm just going to load the solution so you can see what it would look like. So in the first case, oh, I need to start executing from the very top. Here's my function that prints things backwards. Here's, my, uh, here's the function that prints things backwards, and I just call the interact function. And so as I type things, uh, automatically the functions run and prints out the backwards version. Uh, and here's the plot, 
So here's my function that does the plot. And in my solution, uh, I'm going to actually use the decorator version uh, at interact. I give it the parameter values, or here I'm giving it the parameter ranges and the interact, and I'm giving, uh, and then I can plot, and I can actually set the default values uh, by setting the default values in the function definition if I wanted to. So k could start with one, and p could start with uh, two, and then my default parameter values are that. Um, and we also had an answer for the question earlier about how to change this, uh, change this uh, interactive, uh, let's see, where are we? Interact manual name. So here, let me start executing from the start. So, Uh, what's my, oh, I accidentally typed an I there. I typed an A, I think. There we are. Uh, so if you want to change the value uh, of this, you can do interact manual equals run my function or whatever string you want. Uh, let's see. What was the... Was it, oh, manual, what was the parameter value again? Mm -hmm. Manual underscore name. Name, that's what it is. And you need to close. Right. Um, right, mm -hmm. so down here, that's where we do it. There we are. Right, so use this version uh, where you're specifying the manual true, the manual name is run. And the reason why we put it here is so that it doesn't, auto, it doesn't uh, accidentally shadow some parameter name that you may have. That we're trying to separate the, the, the arguments to the interact and the arguments to your function. All right, so with that, let's move on to uh, widgets, the actual widget controls. So this is the, sort of the next step in uh, a more complicated widget interface. And actually uh, constructing the widget controls and assembling them together into some uh, GUI interface. So with that, we're gonna first talk a little bit more about how to think about the widget controls themselves. Um, so let's import first of all. Uh, if we create an int slider, so this is a Python object, and it has a IPython display representation that is this GUI control here. So if you just create an int slider, it's automatically, IPython tries to display it if it's the last thing in the cell, and what you get is the visual representation of the slider, which is a GUI control. You can also use this, the IPython display function explicitly instead of the automatic display that happens if it's the last thing in a cell. And so what I've done here is I've created an int slider, which is this Python object that represents a GUI control, a slider control, and I'm gonna ask IPython to explicitly display this uh, Python object, which in the notebook will display uh, a GUI control, this, this uh, slider control. And because this is a Python object, I can of course ask IPython to display it multiple times. And so here I've displayed this slider, the same slider twice, and you'll notice that it really does represent the same Python object in the back end. Uh, it's just displayed twice in the browser here. So as I change one, auto, the one, other one automatically uh, updates. And understanding why this works helps you have a conceptual framework for how to think about widgets. And here's sort of the model, the mental model to keep. Um, in your kernel in Python, you have a, an object representing this widget. That's what we have right here. And then there's this bridge to your front end, your browser over here. And in the browser, there's two separate distinct objects that we're dealing with here. One is the widget model. This is the thing that keeps track of all the values, all the properties of your widget. The minimum, the maximum, the value, the default text, you know, or, or whatever properties that you can set in the Python side. And then we can have a number of different views of that widget in the front end. So we have a Python object, it's a single Python object. We have a corresponding object in the JavaScript. 
And then we have a number of views of that JavaScript object that's mirroring whatever our Python object is. And each of these views will reflect whatever that Python object is because they reflect what the single object is in the front end, the single model. All right, so let's look at some of the properties. So uh, a lot of the widgets that come with IPy widgets have a dot value property that represents the actual value that you would be, you would be uh, 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 setting in the control. So here the value, if I ask IPython to display, the notebook to display the value, it, you can see it updates as I change. And I can, of course, set the value as well. So here I set the value to 100. What that's doing is it's setting the value property of this widget model in the, this Python object, which is automatically communicating this value to the front end. And then each of the displays, each of the views is updating based on that value. And likewise, when I change the value in the JavaScript side, it's changing one of the views, which updates this model, which then cascades to the other views in the notebook. And it also automatically syncs that value back to Python. And then your code in Python can react to that value change uh, or, or, or get that value. Um, each widget has a number of properties, and you can get the properties by doing the dot keys. And so here you see that we have continuous update, description, description tooltip, max, min, and a bunch of other properties. Um, the, underscore, the properties that start with underscore typically are things that you don't mess with. Uh, they're internal details of how we do our uh, syncing protocol between the front end and the back end. Uh, but anything that st doesn't start with a uh, underscore is fair game for you to modify or change the widget's behavior with. Um, if you want to create a, uh, a, uh, a widget and set the values of these properties, you can also pass them into the constructor. So here we're creating a text widget that starts out with a default value and it's disabled. So that's why it's a little bit grayer and I can't, and I can't type into this. So instead of like what we did up here where we construct a widget and then set the value, we can set each of these properties in the constructor of the widget. Um, it's very easy for us to link two widgets together. Uh, we saw this in the first example, but we'll see it again here. Here I have a, a text and a slider, a text box and a slider. And I use this link function. And what it does is it takes uh, two tuples. And each tuple is the widget and the property of the widget that I want to sync. So here I'm syncing the A's value property with the B's value property, the B widget value property. So what that means is as I change the slider, the text box value is automatically changed. And if I change the text box, the slider's value is automatically changed. And it's very easy to unlink the widgets as well. You notice that this link function gave us back an object. And this object I can just call the unlink function, uh, the unlink method. And now they're not linked anymore. So it's easy to link two values together and unlink them. And there'll be a little more powerful ways to link things together that we'll see uh, later on. So with that, let's, uh, let's look at some of the uh, widgets that come with IPy widgets. So you think about IPy widgets as both a framework for writing these interactive uh, controls, as well as a reference set of widgets that, uh, that supplies basic uh, things that are offered by the browser. Um, and those are sort of what we call the IPy widgets controls, uh, or the, the core controls. And uh, we have a, a nice little GUI here that lets you uh, experiment with looking at the different kind of controls that come, the different controls that come with IPy widgets here. And this is actually an IPy widget control right here itself. So uh, we've grouped them into categories here. Uh, what we want you to do is uh, play with these and look at some of the widgets. And then there's a few exercises down here that ask you to choose a couple of ones and put them together. and. Uh, one of the things you can do is, as you, as you click through this uh, example, you can click on any one of these uh, uh, titles here, and it'll open a new notebook uh, right to an example of how to use that particular widget. Uh, I think there's a few widgets that we don't have examples for, but most, most of the widgets have, we have examples. So here's sliders, buttons, text boxes, uh, select uh, sort of things. And then in the exercises, we ask you to put some things in a container, like an H box or a V box, or even just a box or an accordion or a tab list, et cetera. So we ask you to.
play around with these controls, see what available is available with the core IPy widgets uh, package, and then there's a few exercises down at the bottom uh, that we'll ask you to do. And let's take uh, about 10 minutes uh, to play around with these and, and, and do these exercises. If you have a question, raise your hand. If you have any issues, raise your hand. Or if you want to just talk about what you'd like to do, uh, go ahead and raise your hand. So in about 10 minutes, uh, about 9.01, we'll resume. All right, so let's, let's go ahead and start again. Um, so uh, with the widget list, uh, we had an example. We had at least one solution here. And I'll just display that solution just so you see. Uh, we have a, an int text and, a, and an int slider that we were creating. And then we used a VBox. Uh, and the children argument of the VBox is a list of the things that are going to be vertically stacked. Uh, right here, we labeled it as children, but it's actually the default argument as well. So I could do a VBox with just the list, and it vertically stacks it there. Um, any questions from the tabs or the accordions or the more complicated things that uh, exercises that we asked you to do? OK. Um, I'll give you one more example of a, of a pretty powerful widget that comes with the controls, and then we'll move on to layout widgets. Um, and this is the output widget. Uh, the output widget essentially is what is crucial for making the interact uh, function work. And basically what it does is it captures the output of some code running, and it puts it in a widget. And then you can use that widget and put it in a VBox or an HBox, so you can sort of redirect the output of a function and put it wherever you want in your GUI. Um, so here's an example. Here's an output widget. And we'll see uh, a little bit later, like next, uh, what this layout thing is doing. But for now, you can just see it's, it's creating a border around an empty widget. Uh, you know, this is an uh, empty display. And it gives me a context manager. So I can use the context manager without and uh, do, some do some code. And the output from this code will be stuck inside of the output widget. So if I run this, you see that it goes through the loop. And essentially, the output from this cell, from this code inside this context manager, is not printed in this cell. Instead, it's redirected into my output widget. And this is really powerful if you're trying to build a GUI up and you have some code and it's displaying some stuff and it may even be displaying widgets, et cetera. And you want to take the output and you want to put it in one place in your GUI. And this lets you do that. Um, here's a, a more complicated example. So in that output widget, I want to display this YouTube video. And if we scroll back up to the output widget, there it is. Uh, it's one of the older uh, widgets tutorials. And so it really is uh, the full power of the IPy IPython display system is available inside this output widget. Uh, in fact, we can even display uh, sliders and, and widgets inside of the output widget so you can nest them as deeply as you want. Um, this output widget contains this output, uh, 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 YouTube video display, as well as uh, IPy widget. And um, you can do a few things with the output widget. So here, let's create a new output widget. Um, instead of using that context manager, you can directly uh, append things to the output widget. Uh, here, I'm appending some standard out, and I'm appending a display, uh, display, uh, IPython display message. Uh, I can clear the output. So I can do that with the uh, clear underscore output function uh, method on the output widget. You can see that output widget is now cleared. Uh, or I can use clear underscore output inside of the, uh, inside of the context manager. And another thing that we use uh, that is a convenience method on output widgets is to use it as a decorator for a function. So here, I'm going to run this function, and any output from this function, including errors, any sort of thing that would be displayed from running this function, uh, I'm going to capture it inside of this output widget. Um, I'm going to, it's a little hard to keep scrolling back and forth, so let me run this code again. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how to easily in JupyterLab uh, be able to see what this output widget is. I'm going to right click, and see right click is there, and I'm going to create a new view for the output. What this does is it takes that output and it puts it in a new tab. 
So now I can scroll up and down in my notebook and that output, that cell output is sitting off here to the side. I'll collapse my file browser so we have a little more space here. And so again, we can see we clear the output and the output widget uh, is cleared. And here I'm going to say, anytime this function is run, take the output from this function and throw it in that output widget. And so I'm defining it and then I'm running it. And we see what happened here was uh, the function printed something and then the function raised an exception. And instead of displaying it in the cell, it took all the output from that function and displayed it and redirected it towards the output widget. And this is really the key thing that we needed in order to implement Interact here. And uh, here, let's clear that output. And really what's happening here is for an Interact, this is the example we kind of saw before. Uh, we have uh, the GUI controls and then we have the output of a function. And the output of the function uses this output widget. And here we've uh, taken this uh, convenience function that we showed before, interactive output, which essentially is create an output widget that does this capture thing, this capture thing right here. So create an output widget that captures the result of running this function with the parameter values from my controls. And then I'm gonna sort of uh, change how this interact, interactive GUI is displayed. I'm gonna put the output widget to the right instead of underneath these controls. And so we see here, as I change the controls, it behaves like a normal interact, but the output widget that's capturing the output from this function is off to the side instead of underneath. So if you ever want to do some computation and just use a normal display machinery to display your results or print out your results, but then you want to use those, use that as part of your GUI for widgets, think of using the output widget. So with that, uh, we'll go uh, to Matt and layout and styling. Where's Matt? There's Matt. So one note, if you are having install problems that you haven't been able to solve, if you go to the repository for the tutorial and scroll down to the button that says launch binder, that should take you to an online environment with nothing that you have to install on your computer. So if you're stuck at the moment, you can jump back in that way. Uh, we're going to spend the next few minutes talking about, uh, mostly talking about the layout of Jupyter widgets. Um, there's a couple of things here related to the layout and styling of widget labels, which somehow sometimes the label on a widget gets truncated if the label is too long. Um, and there's some custom styling available for some widgets, like you can set the uh, color on the uh, handle that you drag on a slider. Those two things we're probably not gonna have time to talk about here today, but there's enough detail in there that if you wanna look at those later, you'll, you'll be able to work things out. So good news and bad news about layout of um, Jupyter widgets. So bigger picture here, what we're looking at is how do you take several widgets and compose them into something like an application laid out in the way you want it laid out. Um, good news, you can do everything that we're going to talk about doing in Python. Bad news, from my point of view, haven't done any web development, is it's all based on CSS. <laughs> um, and the, I, I know the problem is not really CSS, the problem is me. Um, but there's a limited set of CSS properties that, that are exposed to the, to the widgets. We're not going to, not going to talk through all of these um, individually. And there's a couple of different interface, interfaces implemented for higher level layout, um, either in a flex block, Flexbox or a grid or in a couple of new layout widgets that were added last week or released last week. Um, that give you an even higher uh, level way to lay out the widgets. So, a little bit about the layout. So every widget has a layout attribute and the value of that attribute has to be a layout object. And in that layout object, you can specify um, the width, height, any of the properties that are listed up here. One thing to be aware of, um, if you misspell something, so I just misspelled height, um, 
Python's okay with that. The browser's okay with that. It, there is no height CSS attribute, so it just ignores it. Um, so just useful to be aware of that. If, if you're trying to change something and it's not changing, there may be a good reason. Um, so the nice thing about this approach to layout is that you can share the layout between several widgets. So if I make a new button here, and for that new button, I'm gonna use the layout from the button I just made, I get the same layout. So this is a handy way if you have multiple components that you want them all to look the same, like the widget list interactive we're looking at, you can specify the layout one time. Uh, so we, we, we call this simple layout, but there's some surprising things even in the simple layout. Uh, so we'd set the width on this to be 50, on the button to be 50% of the available space. If you set a minimum and maximum width, then the actual width is ignored and min and max are used so that as you change the size of the viewport, the, the control scales. So there's a couple of helper classes for laying widgets out, either in a vertical row or vertical column or in a horizontal row. In this particular case, we've made a grid of buttons by building two V boxes, one with correct and horse, and then another V box with battery and staple, and then compose those into a single H box. We'll see in a, a moment that you can do this with a lot less code if you use one of the new le newer layout options. So there are a couple of different CSS specifications for layout that we're gonna talk about. One is Flexbox. The idea with Flexbox is you're laying items out along one axis, either a row or a column, and as you adjust the size of the box, items within that box rearrange themselves to fit within the box in, in using whatever um, constraints you've put on it. Gridbox, or the grid specification rather, provides a nice way to lay out widgets or, or any elements in both rows and columns. Um, and the, so, so again, the, the widget list widget that we saw a couple minutes ago, the layout there was done by specifying a grid layout on each of the tabs. I'm gonna skip most of the text here. Um, we've got it here for reference. There is a, let me find it here. Right, so for more information, there's uh, another couple pages on widgets in the Flexbox model and widgets in the grid model. Um, so it's there for your reference if you need it. Um, you will need it later. But um, So one thing I want to emphasize is that there are two directions in a Flexbox. There's the main axis, which can be either a row, as is drawn up here, or a column. Um, and the cross axis, which is perpendicular to whatever the main axis is. It turns out, so we've got, was it three different classes, four different classes, there's a box, an H box, a V box, and a grid box. H box, V box, and grid box are really the same as box, but with different layouts applied to them by default. It's not quite true, but you can, you can achieve any of the, of the layout styles that you want um, with a plain box and the, and the proper layout. So what I, w what I wanted to get to quickly here is looking at some examples. So in this example, um, we're going to have a box where the flex flow is columns. So the items I put into this box are gonna be um, laid out in columns. Um, and each of the items inside the box is a button. In a couple of minutes, we'll come back to this. I'll have you reverse the order of the buttons in here, change it from a column layout to a row layout, and you can do all of that just by changing the layout. You don't have to change any of the properties of the Python or, or the, the buttons that you're putting in. One advantage of Flexbox is that you can tell it, oh, you can't make your browsers, just a second. I wanna drop out of full screen mode for a second. So these buttons are laid out, each with, its, with a different weight. So the two on the left have a weight one, one in the middle has a weight three. That specifies how the space available is divided between 
the three widgets, and as you shrink the available space, those widgets continue to be scaled down. Wrong way. The sizes of the uh, default sizes for the widgets and IPy widgets uh, have been chosen so that if you put them into an HBox, they're going to line up nicely without doing any additional styling. Um, and again, if I were to shrink the size of the window, this shrinks with the with the viewport that's available. I was surprised when I first saw this example. So you've got something like an image carousel. There's what looks like a lot of code here, but there's you can really break this down into just a couple of pieces. Uh, the, the individual items are set, um, are, are created as a list up here. The key thing that makes this scrollable is setting the overflow to scroll. There is, the, the syntax for this is, or, or the, the name for this has changed a little bit in IPy widget 7.5, it's overflow, not overflow. X, we'll come back to that later. Um, we've set this flex flow direction to row, so things are laid out horizontally. So we, we've got another to our widget here for you to play with. So this widget uh, behind the scenes generates a number of buttons, puts them into a box, and then exposes a bunch of the CSS or layout settings that you can change in IPy widget. So for example, here I've got 18 buttons. I can change that to some other number um, at the moment. The scroll, like the previous example. Um, you can control whether the buttons wrap or don't wrap. So what I'd like to do is give you about five minutes to, five, maybe 10 minutes, to use the, the, the layout widget here, come up with the answers to these questions, and in about five minutes, I'm gonna ask people to share their answers. If you need, if you'd prefer instead of the change settings and see what happens approach, uh, there is a link here to the much more detailed guide. Right. Any any, anybody willing to volunteer and share what um, you figured out justify content effects? <laughs> okay. Well, let's let's take a look. So. Flex start means for justify content means that everything you're putting into the box is going to be laid out so that the rows or columns begin at the front edge of the flex. So it's either on the left side if it's a row or the top if it's a column. Um, center centers those things in, along the main axis. So in this case, because uh, the flex direction is row, um, the whole group of buttons is being centered side to side. One other space between is distributing the space between all of the um, buttons. Let's take a look at align items and align content. So align items is affecting where this entire group of buttons is laid out in the cross axis. So in this case, the main axis is row, cross axis is column, and um, as I change the line items, I'm changing how that whole group of buttons moves. Align content 
changes within a row. Oops, skip that. Did I get those switched? I did. So in I'm not a web developer, round 517 or so, um, I had those switched. So align items is setting things within a row. Align content is moving the entire group of buttons up and down, or you can distribute the space um, around them or however you want. So there's quite a bit you can do with this. Um, there is a series of four exercises coming up, or three or four exercises coming up. So um, in the first one, you'll start with this example from earlier. So we've laid out the four, four buttons here. Um, and I'd like you to modify this so that first, so that the buttons are descriptive Dis displayed in a single column in reverse order, then so that they're laid out in a row instead of in a column, um, and then uh, try a couple of different values of align items to, s to see how that affects the layout. Um, so take a couple minutes, go ahead and do that. What I find helpful with this, um, two things you can do. Uh, I like this widget because if I want to try something out, it's really quick. So for example, if I want to know what row reverse does, I just do it. Another thing you can do in JupyterLab is if you go to the help menu and select contextual help and then drag that off to the side then when you click on an object, it will display the cop doc string in the contextual help. So if you want to see the list of options available for button, for example, click on button, you've got the list right there. If you want at least a short summary of the layout options, you've got them there. So a couple of minutes to change this from current order to reverse order and then from column to row. So I for forgot to mention, but in the um, layout widget, there's a Python code tab, and in that tab, the layout object with all the settings that, you, that you've chosen. Sure, so if you're looking at this widget, there's three different tabs here, the layout one that we've been looking at, there's another tab for setting size options for the box, and then a third tab that's got a display with Python code that, that would reproduce the layout you've selected. Okay, so can somebody tell me how do I, how do I get this, this column of buttons to display in reverse order? There we go, yep. Um, how do I make it a row? Yes, actually, you should. We, do we have any stickers? Special, we should have special stickers for everybody who answers questions. <laughs> how do I how do I display instead of in a row instead of a column? There we go. Oh, it's really small. Um, let's see. Change it. So it was a 20, I'm going to change it to 50. It gets quite a bit larger. Um, to show what happens, if the buttons are larger and you're putting them into a small box and you've uh, told the layout to wrap, then so it's a bit too small. You can conceivably get a grid layout like this. It would be painful, <laughs> but conceivably you could do it. Uh, so a couple things to try with the layout widget from before. So one is to um, 
but there's a couple things you could do. You can try changing to a column instead of a row if you want to. Um, first thing to try though is change the minimum width for one of the items. So in the cell, we've got a list of items. Each item is a button. And um, what I'd like you to do is change the late minimum width for the first button and see what happens. It's helpful here to guess what you think is going to happen when you change the layout for the first button. What do you think is going to happen? Is it going to affect the first button, all of the buttons? Let's see. Yep, they all got narrower. We're all larger. The reason is that their lay all of their for each of those buttons layout attribute is set to this single layout at, uh, item layout object, and so when we change that, it affects all of them. Um, if you wanted to change just the first button, you would have to give the first button a separate layout. But I think we're going to skip that in the interests of moving forward. So the grid layout makes it easier or reasonably straightforward to lay out widgets in two dimensions. As with the flex boxes, there's a much more detailed um, grid layout related to widgets uh, available. I uh, highly recommend the grid layout guide on, on MDN. It's extremely useful. So to make a grid box, um, it's like making any other box. You assign it children. Uh, the layout has a few components. Let me run this, and then I'll talk through it. So working from the bottom to the top, the grid gap is setting spacing between in both x and y direction between the widgets that are being laid out on a grid. Um, each of the columns and, and row properties you can set with a grid template column and grid template rows. Um, in this case, the middle column is narrower because we made it narrower. You can also uh, set the height that way. So one thing to be aware of, let me change the number of buttons here from 9 to 19. So when I do that, we're going to have 10 more buttons d displayed. How are those buttons going to be sized, do you think? Yeah, same as the last column. OK, so one vote for same as the last column. Let's see what happens. So if you put in more items than there are defined grid spots in your template. So our, our template was really three by three because we had three rows, three columns. Um, the remaining buttons are laid out um, using a separate property, grid auto rows for the properties you want for any extra items that are put into the grid that aren't explicitly defined in the template. Um, there's also grid auto columns for changing the um, column properties. So if I add Oops. I mean, not that you want to style it this way, <laughs> but the so the first nine items are styled according to the template you, that you provided, and then all of the remainder are specified using the the auto. Uh, there, there is another way you can specify the grid layout, um, and that's to basically write it out using ASCII art. So you give names to each of the areas that you want to have in your widget layout. Um, in this case, there's going to be a header row at the top with four columns. Um, well, here, let's take a look. And then on the second row, two cells for main area. Dot means leave it blank. Um, sidebar on the right, and then a footer that's four columns wide along the bottom. 
We're going to see in a couple of minutes another way to lay out an application like this that doesn't require quite as much um, text entry to get it to work. If we, how are we doing time-wise here? So take a minute and uh, for this widget, add another row to the template so that the main area is larger. So what I want you to do is modify this so that the um, main area is three rows high and remains two columns wide. So you're gonna need to modify the grid template area to do that. Up to you whether you want the sidebar to be three rows high or whether you want to leave one row high or leave it one row high. Work. So how many people tried this solution? So copy and paste the, the row. Did anybody find a solution that worked? <laughs> oh, 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 oh. So this is actually a great segue to the next <laughs> set of notebooks. Instead of the, Instead of the, and the high ah, okay. Oh, there we go. Thank you. <laughs> this really is a good transition to the next notebook, though. Um, yeah, I'm always surprised by what CSS does. <laughs> Um, there are a few new widgets that were released last week um, as part of 7.5. Um, one is just for laying out a two by two grid of, of widgets. Um, another is to lay out a grid of widgets but with a simpler API and without needing to 
experiment with CSS settings to get it to work. And then the um, third is an app layout that provides a pre predefined layout which you can adjust. So in this first cell up here, we're just creating a bunch of um, buttons and texts and uh, laying out the buttons so that they'll expand to fill the available space. So to make a two by two layout, it's fairly straightforward. You have to tell it which widget you want in the top left, top right, bottom left, bottom right, and the widgets are put there. If you leave one of the spots out, so in this one, I uh, gave it top left, bottom left, bottom right, but no top right, and that was filled in by the bottom right, expanded to fill the available spaces in the grid. You can prevent that if you want to by telling IPy widgets not to merge any unused cells. So if you wanted the white space there, you can have it. You can change this after you've created the widget. So um, top right and so on are like any other widget property. You can set them in initialization or you can change them later. And if you change it later, it changes the set of buttons. So you can imagine this being useful, for example, if you have a set of controls that you want off on one side and the set that you display depends on what the user is, has selected in some other widget. Uh, so in this one, we've laid out uh, two text boxes, two sliders, and each of those individual widgets is still a widget. So you can link the values of the sliders and text boxes. Uh, one of the themes as we get later into today is that many of the widget packages allow you to place widgets into them, um, which seems maybe straightforward when you're talking about a grid layout like this, but when the widget you're looking at is a spreadsheet and each of the cells can be a widget, it's a little bit mind bending. You can use this if you want for more. Oh, right. Detailed layout. So in this case, we're using BQ plot to make a bar chart on the right and setting the min and max values of the graph with the sliders on the left. This is a two by two layout where on the right side, there's just one widget displayed. Uh, one of the other new widgets is the app layout widget. So this predefines a header that spans three columns, a footer that spans three columns, and then a left bar, center, and a right bar. By setting some of those things to none, you can change the layout quite a bit. So you don't need to, I, when I first saw this, I thought, oh, that's nice, but what if I don't want a left bar? Or what if I don't want a right bar? You just leave it out, and the other content expands to fill the available space. OK, I'm going to skip the next few cells here because we need to get to events. Um, but I encourage you, the next time we have a break, if you want, explore some of the um, other variations on the app layout. The final layout widget we'll mention is the grid spec layout. So this does the kind of thing we were trying to do manually a couple minutes ago, where we tried modifying the CSS and it didn't work. So to use a grid spec layout, you give it the number of rows, number of columns, and then you fill in each of those rows and columns by indexing it. As with most things in Python, you can slice it. And so you can assign multiple grid cells. In this case, it's all of the rows, column zero, um, to the button number or labeled two. So what's nice about this, right, this is the kind of thing I was trying to do a few minutes ago. It took like 50 of us to figure out the right way to do that. Um, <laughs> Whereas here, I, I, it, it's much more straightforward to tell it how many grid cells you want and then just assign widgets to those grid cells. Each of the individual cells is still a widget. So if you change its value, its value updates in the widget. 
Here we change the description on the first button. If one grid conflicts with another, so in this case, the I believe the top one interferes with um, one of the bottom ones down here. Do you know if it's last one wins or first one wins if there's conflict between, it's probably last one wins. Is it first? Yep. Oh, here we go. So we're about to do row three, column one. Again, we can replace the button. Okay, so I think this is a good point to st stop for questions. Anything about layout so far? Okay. Then let's jump ahead to, yeah. You know what, we're gonna take a break for 10 minutes because the food goes away in 20 minutes. So <laughs> quick break for 10 minutes, then we come back, we'll talk about events and then move on to a tour of more sophisticated widgets. So Wi-Fi widgets provides the basic core controls and the stuff that Martin and Martin are gonna talk about provides a lot of fun higher level stuff. So we'll start up again here at 10.15. All right, let's start back up. So a few takeaways from widget layout. Um, things you should remember when you're, when, when you're sitting down starting to write your own sets of widgets. Hbox and Vbox for laying things out along one direction. Gridbox if you want fine grain control over exactly how the um, grid of widgets looks. And app layout if you're looking for something higher level um, but somewhat constrained. Grid spec layout, if you want something higher level, but you have a bit more flexibility. Questions about the layout and before we switch to talking about events. Okay, so I'd recommend some point later work through the rest of the cells in the um, in the higher level widget. I want to remind you there is a page that we're not going to go through here today about widget styling of descriptions, which by default often get truncated, and another about some, some detailed styling. You can do buttons and a couple of other widgets. Okay, so let's talk about widget events. So we've seen a couple ways so far of interacting with widgets and attaching widgets to each other. One was to use link, and we've seen one example, I think, already where we've used observe. Um, so buttons have an additional way of, of handling events. There's an on-click method for buttons in which you can like we saw with observe earlier, give on click the name of a function and um, that function is called whenever you click the button. One reminder, to get this to display, which you might be tempted to do first, is to not have the output. That won't work. So, so what's happening is you click the button, uh, your browser tells Python, hey, the button was clicked. Python says, oh, I know what to do when the button's click. I should print the output, or I should print button clicked. Um, sends that back to the browser, and the browser's like, I don't care. You didn't tell me what to do with that output. Um, oh, it's only in JupyterLab. Uh, there's not too much more to say about 
on Glick. It's fairly straightforward. So I want to talk a bit more about traitlet events. So the keys that Jason described earlier um, that each widget has is a list of all of the things about that widget which are automatically monitored for you in the background by the IPI widgets framework. So anytime one of those keys is changed, you can attach a callback to that and take some appropriate action. Um, to do that, you need to write a short function, which, um, let's jump ahead here, takes a single argument. So in this widget, we've got a slider where the uh, integer of a few values and a label above it whose value has changed as you change the slider, the callback that does that is here. So all of the callbacks always take a single argument, a dictionary. Uh, the keys of that dictionary depend on what the um, event type is. Most often when I'm writing uh, callback functions myself, the thing that I want to use is, it, or, or it's getting called because a value has changed and um, I'm after the new value. So there's two pieces to using this. So one is to find the callback function, the other is to tell the slider that it needs to observe changes to the name value. You could give a list of names here if you wanted to keep track of the value and whatever the rest of the keys are for a slider. Um, the min and max, for example, are properties. You can monitor the min and max or change the min and max in, re in response to, to another widget. Um, and you tell it what function you want to call when the event happens. Another example, uh, again, using an output widget. I know this flickers a lot, but I didn't want it scrolling way off the, uh, off the screen. So I want to say a little bit about why observe instead of link, because in every example we've seen so far, you could have used link to do what we're doing. So I thought it would be handy to have a calculator, so no matter where you're from, you're from, you can decide whether it's actually hot out or if it just feels hot. Um, and I've set this up so that I can type in a temperature in Celsius, do some unit testing here, see if 100 gives me the correct, yep, Fahrenheit is 212. Um, two point straight line, I'm from Minnesota, so I happen to know <laughs> where the two cross. <laughs> we got within three degrees of that air temperature this year. Um, so quick exercise, there's a couple lines you would need to fill in to change this so that when you change the temperature in Fahrenheit, it updates the Celsius temperature. <coughs> so to make that happen, you, there's two things to fill in. One is uh, finish defining this function on F change. It will be handy to look back at what, we, what was done up here for on C change. And then add the line to tell, or, or to have the degree F widget observe changes and, and call this callback. And we'll give you just a couple minutes to do that. Okay, so help me out here. What should I put on the right-hand side? Change of new. Okay, and then um, how do I observe? So you start with the widget, 
that you want to observe something and then tell it what you want it to do when something changes. And now, there we go. Right, so in this case, you can't use link because you need, to, you, you need to do a calculation with the values to update them. And so straight up link won't work. Observe allows you more flexibility in what you do with those values. Um, there's a couple other things I wanna make you aware of, and then I'm gonna turn things over to Martin and Martin. So there is more you can do with linking. Um, I'm just gonna mention what those things are. One is, and then later time you can take a look. So D-link lets you set up a directional link. So changing widget A affects widget B, but changing widget B doesn't affect A. JS-link and JSD-link are bidirectional and unidirectional links where the, the processing of the link is done in JavaScript in your browser. Um, Somebody asked during the break, what's the difference? Why would you use one over the other? My response was, I don't remember the last time I actually used JS Link myself. <laughs> okay, but Martin will explain the context, is, context in which, which JS Link is useful. Um, I also want to mention, we're not, I'm not even going to open them up. There are, is a set of four notebooks that walk through creating a really simple password generator as a way to, to demonstrate a couple of different ways of handling widget events. Um, and the last part of that lays out one way of doing that using classes instead of functions and global variables. So there's so many new high level widgets that we want to talk about today that we're not going to go through that exercise in detail. Um, instead, I'll hand it over to you guys if you're ready. And we're switching laptops, right? Right, so um, more widgets libraries. So actually, Hyper Widgets is not only a collection of, um, of uh, basic widgets like uh, buttons and sliders. It's also um, a framework upon which you can create um, new higher level widgets um, because it has a well-defined protocol for discuss discussing between the Python object and the visual representation of this widget. Uh, so you can, I if you know a bit of JavaScript or TypeScript, you can, you can actually start uh, using the Cookie Cutter project. You can start your own uh, widget libraries. So I I'm going to go through uh, some of them. Um, the first one is IPaniflet. IPaniflet is a interactive maps libraries uh, based on IPA widgets. You can create a map widget like that. And because it's a widget, you can access uh, its attributes from Python, and you can set them. So if I do zoom equal 11, it changes the map. You can also change the layout. Yeah. So um, on the map, you can apply um, some layers. So you can add markers, heat maps, uh, video overlays, um, so let's start by changing the base uh, layer. I will put nether images from yesterday. And I can create a slider widget changing the date. So as you can see, it's pretty annoying to go back and forth. So I can do like Jason did before, but I can create a view for the, for the map and put it on the side. So that's a bit better. But you can also do that programmatically using Jupyter Lab Sidecar, 
which allows you to create a context manager and do with my sidecar display the map. And it works. Um, so I can, I can add markers like that. The marker is a widget. It's not a widget that, that you can display in the notebook. Um, so if I do mark, I won't see anything. So you, you actually have two types of widgets. Widgets that, are, that have a, a visual representation in the, in the notebook and widgets that doesn't. But in this case, in this case I can just uh, push the marker uh, on the map and it will be displayed on the map. Uh, it's also a widget, so I can access the location, I can set it. So it has to inherit from DOM widget if it has a visual representation, and if it doesn't, it inherits from widget. Yeah. not really linked to the map because the like the marker knows itself where, it, where its location if its visibility so the map only just shows the marker on, on itself but there's the map the map has to have some kind of functionality to know what to do with the marker yeah sure yeah. definitely yeah it knows it knows what what is a marker and how to create a view of the marker and, and add it to the map Yeah, you can do that. Yeah. Put the same mark on a different map, and they will be. And and whenever you move the mark, yeah. Yeah. Don't do that mark. Yeah. So you can change the visibility of the marker. You can interact with uh, its opacity like that. You can link a pop-up to the marker. So in this case, I create a float slider that is linked to the opacity of the marker, and I say marker.popup equals slider. And whenever I click on the marker, I, ha I have the slider here. So I can put a slider, but actually I can put any widget in it. I could put uh, a, a 2D plot, a 3D plot, uh, anything that is, that is a dumb widget, that is a, a widget that can be displayed, uh, can be added as a pop-up. You can create a marker cluster. Uh, yeah. You can create a heat map. So here I'm generating a random data and adding it to the map. I can on button click, I can generate new, uh, new data. I can link a slider to one attribute of the heat map. So that's for layers. Uh, y you also have controls with the map. So for example, I can have a split map control, which will allow me to compare two layers, like that. Um, what I didn't say is that, maybe you know it, but in JupyterLab you have themes, so I can switch to dark theme, and the API leaflet by default will update the CSS of um, of the controls according to the theme, and that's completely automatic. If you if you create your own theme, um, Apple Leaflet will work with it. Um, I can remove it. I can create a widget control. So it's a control on which I put a widget. Again, it can be any widget. Here it's a button, and when I click on this button, I go to New York City. Um, yeah, that's an advanced example. So with this example, I will load some data. So, yeah. Um, so say you have some uh, wind streams data or um, uh, uh, ocean streams data. You can load them and display them on the map. So that one is really cool. Um, another nice example, IPLeaflet supports uh, GeoJSON. Uh, 
data. And I have hover events. So here, whenever I, I, I put the mouse on one of the elements of the GeoJSON, I will update this widget control here, which is actually an HTML widget. And it will show me the density of, uh, of, of the, the state I'm hovering on. So there is a small exercise. If you have a pamphlet installed on your computer, you can try it. Um, uh, so first create a map, then create a slider and controlling the zoom level of the map, and then maybe embed it um, using a widget control on the bottom left of the map. Uh, I think, yeah, it can take four minutes, four or five minutes. <laughs> So the first one is quite easy. Just do m equal map. You just create the map and you display it, and it works. the The default zoom, zoom level and position is maybe weird, but all right. Yeah, internet connection. So for the slider, you can do you can create an in slider given the min value and the max value. And do link the value of the slider to the map zoom level. And display the slider. Yeah, I don't have internet. Too many people are loading the map. Yeah. <laughs> We're getting banned. So it's working. And if you want to embed it, the slider in a widget control, you just create your widget control like that given the widget value, the slider, and do position equals bottom left. And then you do m plus equal the value. And that works. You have it there. So it is fetching images uh, through internet, but I, uh, apparently I don't have internet. Well, it, it's a bit slow. So that's it for a pine leaflet, which is quite ni quite nice. Um, Py3.js now. Maybe some of you know 3.js. It's a JavaScript library for doing um, um, for easy WebGL in the browser, and. There is a binding for Python using uh, hyperwidgets. So it's very low level in that you have to create the scene yourself, the meshes, um, the shaders, if you want to write shaders, the camera, every, everything, you, you have to do it by hand. So, but everything is a widget. So if you change like the scale of this mesh, it updates if you to a small animation, it works from Python using a for loop. Um, you can create like a clickable surface like that. So it gives you a lot of flexibility because it's very low level, but you have to know a bit about uh, 3D. Um, if you if you are familiar with Matplotlib, you uh, yeah, Matplotlib. You can use IPyMPL, which is the widget backend of Matplotlib. So, yeah, you can link like we've done before with the the hook for redisplaying the plot. Here, it's the same plot. The same plot. It uh, only updates itself. The toolbar is a widget as well, so you can change the style of the toolbar and and you can set its status. 
you can make you can make three D plots. You can save the image. Um, you can make subplots. Yeah. The next one is IPy3. So IPy3 is a tree widget based on IPy widgets. It provides two widgets, the tree and the node. And you can create a small tree with two nodes, like that. Just tree.addNode uh, and the node that you want to create. You can do. You can add them dynamically. Uh, if you want, you can change uh, node names. So here, node three. I will link it to a text widget, and it updates. You can change node icons, and you can handle click. So here. Whenever I click on this one, it says I'm selected. So this allows you, like, if you if you study binary trees, you can display them like that. Or if you want to make a, a complex UI using bqplot, type leaflet, and have a tree view on the side that selects, I don't know, the, the layers and the controls that you display on the map, you can use iPad tree. It's pretty simple. Um, IPy sheet. If you like Excel and you miss Excel in um, in Jupyter Notebook, you can use IPy sheet, which is, which is a spreadsheet widget in Jupyter Notebook. You create a sheet and some cells. So each cell is a widget. So if you um, if you set the value like that, it updates. If you set it from there, it works too. Uh, you can lo load a pandas data frame or an NumPy array. And then you can edit the, the cell. You can link a spreadsheet to a bqplot plot. So Martin will show you, show you bqplot later. But if I have a bqplot here, I can link the data uh, to the points. Um, you have a calculation decorator, which allows you to do like formulas in, um, in Excel. So here I link this slider to this cell here. And this cell will be the sum of the two of the ones. So whenever I change this one, it computes the, su the sum. You can have custom renderers. So if I want to see uh, negative elements, uh, more easily, I can have custom renders for that. So custom renders are only functions that returns the CSS uh, uh, attribute of the cell, given the value. You can embed interactive widgets in cells. So you can embed whatever you want, as long as it's a widget, in the cells. And then you can export it to a data frame. And it will take the widget values. So this one is a small hack from last weekend. Uh, I was a bit bored on Saturday, so <laughs> I worked on it. And so it's IPy Canvas. It's um, the, um, exposing the Canvas API from the browser to Python. So it's you can create a canvas like that, and you have small functions for drawing path and uh, circles, changing the color of, of it. And this is very low level, like you have to type a lot before having something on the screen. But it, it gives a lot of flexibility. You can display multiple views. It gives, it gives a lot of uh, flexibilities if you want to, I don't know, display a heat map and you don't you don't find a su uh, suitable library for that, you can do it yourself. You can display, y you can make a Pac-Man game if you want. <laughs> um, yeah. So that's it for me. Um, Martin will keep on 
yeah, we'll show bqplot and other widgets libraries. Thanks, uh, Martin. So I, um, I hope you got a bit of a, a, an overview of some widgets and saw the connection to what you learned in the beginning. So all the, the way like observing changes, every, everything you change from the kernel gets propagated to the, the front end. Something you do in the front end gets propagated to the back end. And that's like key in all of these libraries. And um, so let me now show uh, BQplot. This was actually one of the first libraries, right, Jason, to be based on IPy widgets. Um, so BQplot is a uh, plotting library um, built with the uh, grammar of graphics uh, in mind. And let me do some, I'm just going to generate some data. And um, so one of the APIs BQplot has is a, a like PyPlot API, uh, like Matplotlib-like. Um, so this looks like Matplotlib code, but actually this is not a static image, so I can zoom and pan, etc. Uh, so this is a, a line plot, uh, scatter plots with colors, uh, histograms. So this is l what I'm showing here is like the high level API, um, but underneath are widgets. And again, some of these widgets, like a linear scale, if you're familiar with uh, grammar of graphics, the linear scale basically does mapping from like data to uh, what the uh, visualization should do, is not something you can represent graphically, but it's something that BQplot uses internally. So here we're building up um, a similar plot, but using the, the widget components. And because they're widgets, we can change them. So line, so this is this bqplot lines object has this x and y property and we can change that. And if we change it, bqplot will just update the data. It won't redraw itself. Um, and what's also really nice is uh, because it's built on uh, D3, uh, um, you have this nice animation. So if you have some data and you want to see like, okay, if I put in this data, what does it look like? And you see it changing slowly instead of like a real quick, uh, quick change. Um, so here as well for a scatter, a scatter plot, but it's not only like the data you can change, any attribute of any of the widgets in BQplot you can, uh, can change. For instance, if I change, so XS is the linear scale, so the scale of the X axis, that's now determined from the data, but if I set it to 4, it will change and I set it back, or from the x-axis I can set a label and it will change this label. So you don't have to like regenerate your plot all the time, but you can interactively explore and learn also the API by just uh, uh, trying out. Um, so what's, again, so um, if you do some interaction, in the browser, so what I'm doing here now, it's called a fast interval selector. Uh, using the relative uh, height of my cursor and the position, I select a particular region. And this is all happening in the browser, but it gets sent back to uh, the kernel. So in Python, you can get access to, hey, what, what did I select? And do some processing based on that. So it's really like this interactive, like you have a plot, you select something which is easier to do like officially, and then again, do some computations with it. Um, or other interaction, like, oh, you need to cheat a little bit, like, oh, this doesn't look good, let's make it. That's also useful. Well, it's not for, for cheating, but uh, you could use it, uh, don't do it. But uh, uh, like if you need to uh, like generate some data, which is like easier to do, or you need to smooth something, why use like an algorithm if you can do it like in one second using this? Um, so this is an example. And again, let me, let me go through the code. Well, first I'll do an ex uh, show what it does. So you take a point, and if, if it point changes, it will calculate a mean. But let's take a look at the code. So what, wh how does it work? So you've seen this observe. So if you know that a scatter has an X property, 
you know that you can call like observe and have a function being called if it changes. That's not something you need to learn from BQplot. That's something you learned in the beginning of this uh, tutorial. Like you can observe changes and do some computations on, on that. So and then if you change X or Y, then it will do some calculation and updates and etc. Uh, so that was BQplot. So iPyVolume is um, the first widget library I wrote. Um, I'll sh uh, say a bit more on the motivation behind that later. Um, so that's basically for a 3D visualization. So again, a matplotlib-like API. And you can have a, like a, a zoom in and out and like change it, have a full screen mode. Actually also, if you have a Google Cardboard, you can do like VR. Uh, with it. Um, so, yeah, there was a question about JS link. So, let me get back to that. Um, so, I'm here I'm creating a, a, a plot with a, a quiver. So, they're like um, uh, representing like a, maybe a vector field or something. And the reason why I wanted to build on top of IPA widget, because first I didn't, it was just like uh, using jQuery, et cetera, and I needed to create sliders to control some components. I was like, I, I don't, I want to focus on the 3D fish, not on making sliders. And I thought like, if I build on top of IPA widgets, I can take their sliders and link them to one of uh, the properties I have. So that's an example here. I take a float slider for the size and a JS link it to the quiver size. And I do that with a few properties. So now I can change these on the fly. And actually also got like, I didn't know it existed, but there was a color picker. So I linked that to one of my colors and you can change it. So there was a question about um, JS link. Um, so you can save um, this plot as an HTML file, static HTML file, and then you can open it. And because it's a demo, it doesn't work. Okay. So it should work on the documentation page. Yeah. So here you have the same example on the documentation page. And I put the sliders here. And it still reacts to that. Well, there's no Python process going on. So this is all happening in the browser. If you use JS link, on the browser side, it's linking properties together. And there's no Python process. This is just like living in the HTML. Um, and if you use link, you cannot. It communicates back through the, uh, the, uh, the kernel. Okay. IPy WebRTC was kind of a, like a hack, but it's uh, it's becoming a, uh, well, it's, it, it's a front project, but can also be useful for capturing video output. So the, the motivation behind WebRTC was basically Google wanted to make Hangout, a Google Hangout, and they made an API for this. And it's actually more about like, um, um, like media streams, with, which can be audio or video. So you can have a video stream from a file. You can have a camera stream. Yes, that's working. Hi there. Um, and these video stream, video on camera is a, like a media stream, and you can use this in the, on, in the browser quite flexibly, and you can use these as textures in IPy, IPy volume. So I was like, okay, I need to try, and there's like, I don't know, ten lines of code to get this working, and and then I was like, so. Actually, this is a WebGL canvas, which can also be a media stream. So it's like, can I make, uh, like IPy volume is then like a media stream, can I plot it on itself? And yes, you can. <laughs> so you can have this like really like trippy psychedelic things. Um, and yeah, just works. Uh, but the idea behind WebRTC is for, uh, um, for Okay, we have, so sh let's try a new one. So um, um, it's basically um, uh, WebRTC. Uh, di did you join already? I'm I hope it's gonna work. It depends a bit on the network if it's gonna work. Does it show up at your computer? Too bad, so what you, 
what you should see is you should uh, see Martin here because WebRTC for like communicating to each other. And then, um, so it's really flexible on how you can, no? No, it's not, no. there is something, yeah. Yeah, it's probably like firewall issues uh, on the network here. We tried it this morning and it, uh, it worked. Um, and video recording. So you can record this, uh, like make, uh, make some, uh, some nice plot and rotate it. And then you have like the recording of that and the data is again um, in this, uh, this property. So you can save this to disk and just or download it, yeah. Um, so let me see. I'm gonna skip this one, I'm gonna go to I. So let me show you, yeah. So there's one notebook, um, yeah, I can show you, yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll show a bit more, I'll talk about it uh, uh, tomorrow, Fax, which is a library for uh, work uh, like a pandas replacement for working with uh, really large data sets and the inspiration uh, it was actually the motivation to start working with uh, widget because I wanted to like be able to plot uh, large amounts of data on top of uh, things and work with it interactively and um, of course yes um, and like the data we had at the time was like dark matter simulations. This is, uh, I don't know how many, uh, much data this is, but basically making a histogram out of it and, uh, and uh, plotting that basically a bit like um, what you maybe have seen uh, data shader. So this UI I'll show in the next um, notebook. And also uh, was the motivation to create IPy volume. So you can create these like uh, uh, 3D plots and to interactively like zoom into these simulations, we'll do the regridding again, etc. So the next notebook I I'm gonna show in the classical notebook because uh, there's like two things. Uh, we just have support for JupyterLab 1.0 this morning. So if you didn't install it, or if you installed it before like this morning, you should execute this command. I'll show it later uh, today as well. And there's one issue that I don't know uh, yet what the, uh, what the cause is, so let me um, make sure that this is working. Okay, so this is another project by um, uh, partnership with uh, uh, Quantstack and Société Générale. Olivier <laughs> Baudrier is uh, kind of the, uh, uh, the person behind it. It's uh, all the work is done by Mario Bauchhausen. And the idea is to uh, wrap Vutify. And Vutify is a few based library. So who here knows few? One person, who kno uh, knows React? Yeah, kind of. So those are like two of the m like modern frameworks for web development now. So we have React and Vue, and um, next to that you have the um, material design spec of Google, which basically saying what buttons should look like, what should happen when you click on it, etc. And in the Vue world, there's a library called Vutify, and it implemented a large portion of this uh, uh, spec. So they basically created a whole bunch of like uh, uh, widgets for us in the JavaScript world. And this library tries to wrap all of these components to have like real modern looking uh, widget respecting the, uh, the material design spec. <laughs> so for instance, if you click on a button, it will, uh, will show some, uh, uh, some nice animation. There lots of versions of buttons. So if you have an Android phone or use Google service, you probably recognize a bit of the, like the look and feel of uh, this. Um, like spinners for animations, um, toolbars with icons, more icons, tooltips. Um, Something that's, for instance, not in core iPy widgets is um, drop-down menus, because this is not something that's like in core HTML, although some of it is, but uh, you need to rely on a particular JavaScript library, so you need to make a choice there. And this library is very opinionated, it's using this, and that's supported. Um, so uh, uh, so we, we basically get this uh, for free. Dialogs, 
Uh, some people think they're evil. Sometimes you need them. So they're available. Sliders, like different versions of sliders. Um, I really like this one. So this is a select widget. And, but as you see, the label is like on top of it. So it's not to the left or the right, so it can save a, a lot of space. And again, the animations. Um, tabs, tab widgets. Um, yeah, navigation drawer, it's not so clear maybe from this example, but it is, I'll show you uh, one later. And expansion panels, so these are like um, uh, accordion widgets. And there was a question from uh, from you, like, can you have like multiple uh, expanded? So um, I will show you later a bit, but this expansion panel content is like one of the children of this expansion panel. And let me open this link. If you go through the documentation, Basically, the, uh, what Futify looks like, it's almost HTML. You have this mapping of like um, V-list style with dashes going to what's called kebab style or kebab casing to uh, camel casing. So if you see this example, there's probably something called V-expansion uh, panel. So let's take a look. You go to the documentation, expansion panel. And Here's some example of how you would use this in view. And you don't need to be an expert. We're just gonna look like, I was looking here and say, okay, expand, leaves expansion panel open when selecting another. So we just copy paste. <laughs> and now multiple of them can be, uh, can be expanded. Um, so you saw some code example here. There's, uh, there's a thing called a, a, a Futify template where you can basically, what I've done, just copy paste some example of, of, uh, uh, from the web page uh, to have a more like, uh, uh, like sophisticated like layout where you can control like what it looks like, floating or not, and dark. And um, you need to define some traits well, probably uh, we didn't treat this uh, today. And again, it's a widget. So we just created a new widget on the fly and I can change some of the properties. You saw this button changing, changing. So that's really uh, like a powerful way of creating like new widgets on the fly. So I want to try a little bit, well, I'm already showing you the solution. Well, you ca I can, of course. So um, kind of the mapping of what you see in Futify to how it would look like in uh, IPy Futify is explained like in this list and documentation. So if you have V slider, you have V slider, V model. Um, if you have like children elements, it will be a children attribute. So what I want you to try to do is just see if you can get from the documentation an example how you can create like a radio group and try like putting this uh, this together and uh, let's do um, two minutes or something two three minutes just to see like how this mapping goes so let me quickly like show you how i would uh, would uh, do this let go radio. Huh, that's interesting. This is really old. So there are some examples here. Uh, I don't understand why the... Yeah, some simple example here. So you have a radio group and a radio, they take labels. Uh, this one also takes a label actually. Um, 
So I'm just gonna show you how I would like do this. So we do something like a, a radio. Yeah, just rely on the autocomplete. Okay, that worked. Ah, radio group. And then you want to have like children. Like this example here has like uh, this, has like child components and as shown in the documentation here, if you have like fee button and you have something like text, you would do like children equals. So we want to make like radio. Is K. Gonna do list comprehension. Is everybody comfortable with that? So now we also need to give it a value. Otherwise it doesn't know like how to select particular uh, uh, items. And now we created like a new, let's give it a name, radio group and print it out. Oops. Uh, let's like select a value. Hey, that's sweet. Uh, I think there's a, yeah, there's, there's something like what you expect to do is something like this. Options. And that it would change, but it's actually, because it's Futify, and we try to wrap Futify, it's not a value, but V model, and we're thinking of changing this. So in future versions, it will probably be different. Like it will be more like widget-like. And I think this should be close to the solution I had. Yeah. Okay. Um, so there's another example of making a new widget. We're gonna skip that and give uh, um, Jason the, uh, a chance to, uh, to show a really, really cool new widget library. Whew, that was a lot, right? A lot to absorb. We're getting close to lunch, that's good. Um, I just wanna reemphasize what Martin said. Everyone take a deep breath, get some oxygen, and, uh, and, and just reemphasize the takeaways from this last sort of show and tell bit. And that is uh, the framework to think about widgets is that you have a Python object that's communicating to an object in your browser, and they're sharing attributes and syncing attributes back and forth, and then there's views of that JavaScript object. And these, the cool thing about this is there are tons and tons and tons of cool interactive ways of dealing with things in the browser. There's tons of JavaScript libraries like the, like the WebGL, the 3D graphing, the mapping, and all sorts of things. Just like your imagination is sort of limitless for uh, the things that you can do in a browser and the things that people are creating today in the browser for being able to interact with things. And the cool thing about the widgets is that it lets you take advantage of all these different ways of interacting with things in the browser and map that to Python objects so that now you can use the browser interactive capabilities to interact with Python objects. And it's two-way. You can use Python programmatically to modify and change things in the browser. So you have two-way communication between cool interactive things in the browser and Python objects. And, and that's the cool... I think that's the real thing, the advantage and the, and the uh, uh, cool thing that you see from widgets is it lets you take advantage of the huge amount of development effort going on these days and making the browsers a tool that you can interact with. Um, and one of the cool things is uh, the browsers can interact things that are not just uh, pixels on the screen. The browsers can interact with physical controls as well. So my dad was an audio engineer and growing up, uh, I had the opportunity to, to sometimes touch his, you know, huge Mackie console and, and the faders and the knobs and the huge lights and things like this. I don't know if you've ever touched a professional audio console, but it's just amazing. It's much, much better than like clicking these 
plastic keys or touching a glass screen. It's much more satisfying. Um, and so the cool thing is, is the browser allows us to talk to audio, uh, professional audio equipment um, and have some physical controls as well as just on screen things. So this is a uh, MIDI controller and the browser can talk to it. And the cool thing about the browser talking to it is now this thing is that physical MIDI controller and now I can use that to talk to my Python code. So I can use the MIDI controller here through the browser to talk to my Python code. So let me show you an example. Uh, let's see. Uh, okay, the one disadvantage is that Chrome is the uh, only browser right now that implements this standard, the Web MIDI standard. But uh, what I have here is, let me make this a little bit bigger, um, a set of sliders and checkboxes and things like this. And these sliders and checkboxes correspond to these controls. So I can change these controls, and you'll notice that the, uh, the sliders are changing. I can press the buttons to toggle on and off the checkboxes. I can even press the, the knobs, and it'll turn on and off the checkboxes. I've got a fader over here. I've got two buttons over here that I set up to just be on when I hold them down and be off when I, un and when I, when I pull off of them. These buttons are set to toggle so that they toggle on or toggle off. And now I've got these physical controls. Now I'm not so jealous of my dad working with these professional physical controls. And, and each one of these things can be doing stuff with my Python code. And my Python code can listen to every value that changes from this, this, this knob here or these sliders, these faders, these buttons, et cetera and be making any sort of, I mean, you could be running any sort of code. And my Python code can, of course, change the state of this control. So here's a, here's a little game that I do with my kids where, you know, just set some random thing and they have to play whack-a-mole to turn it off before I run it again. But the point here is that we have this interactive communication between the browser, which is then talking to this physical device, and my Python code. And it's a two-way communication. This controls Python code and my Python could, code can control this. And so sort of the sky is the limit here. The, because the browser is such a pervasive platform and people are developing so much for the browser, uh, the sky is the limit for being able to do cool interactive things, even to physical controls with your Python code, both the cool interactive things talking to your Python code and the Python code controlling the cool interactive things. And this is some, sort of the, the capabilities that we get because we thought about IPy widgets very much as not just a set of sliders and checkboxes, but as a framework for building interactive uh, GUIs. OK, so that's my cool demo from, from, from this last Christmas. And if you want to come up and feel this, it's amazing. You just like want to punch these buttons, these soft, physical, rubber, clicky buttons with pleasing lights. And I don't know. I could do it all day. <laughs> Yeah, let's take a short Four break. Four-minute break? Yeah, uh, let's just, yeah, just, just do a five-minute stand-up, stretch, get some air, break, and then the last part is going to be how to build a web app and actually deploy it to people that don't want to see a notebook, don't want to see any code. They just want to see the end-resulting web app that they can interact with. Should we uh, start again? I think there's still some people outside, but um, so what we want to do with the, the last uh, like 35 minutes we have is that you maybe come up with your own example, like some custom widget or like some simple example, and uh, basically deploy that as a web app. Um, so that's what uh, we're going to use Voila for that. So Voila is kind of like the dashboarding answer to Jupyter Notebooks. Um, so what it does, it takes your notebook, it runs the whole notebook, and will show you the output cells. Um, people are not um, allowed to uh, like modify your code or see your code. So um, let me show you what it looks like. So if you, if you are uh, using JupyterLab, you can install this lab extension, and then you get a button here, and we have a simple... Let's this uh, a simple uh, notebook with some markdown a so let's run it a Jupyter widget where I change the slider and show the um, uh, what do I do the square of uh, the value 
Uh, there's actually some uh, LaTeX uh, on this page. Uh, Why in that? Hmm, interesting, yeah. Um, and uh, uh, showing uh, like a Pandas data frame, so this is like rich HTML output. And now I'm gonna click this button, and it will open a new panel and just show me the output. And this still works. So what I said like before with the link, you can only do it when there's like no Python process attached anymore. With voila, what you're seeing here is that there's still a Python process running behind it. You don't see the code. Um, and actually, if you use the classical notebook, so let's you, uh, let's go here. You should see this button, voila. Same notebook, but now it opens in a new uh, uh, browser tab. And this is what you get. So the same output, not shown the input cells. Uh, th so this is basically safe. People are not allowed to like uh, uh, remove files, etc. as long as you uh, write your notebook safe. Um, so now I want to show you like the various ways in which you can use uh, uh, Voila. So make this a bit bigger. Uh, so it's also a command line util, so if you have Voila installed, and I saw the icon already, so some people have it installed, um, you can run it from the command line like this, and it will open a new tab and show you the page. So it's running a server and you can connect to that. If you give the notebook to a URL, it will only show that notebook. If you give a directory, will show you like all the uh, uh, the notebooks in that uh, directory. So which one was it? Voila basics. And we can click this notebook. And here we see like voila, render, and then the uh, notebook path. Uh, let me show you another way of doing this. So if you run, uh, because, because of something we're gonna uh, do later. So if you do Jupyter notebook, so I'm just gonna run it again. Um, like voila is a server extension. So if I have a notebook open here, so again, gonna show the same notebook. If you look at the URL, it says notebooks. And we saw the URL before. If there's a, if JupyterLab, Jupyter Notebook, or Jupyter Server, is running, so Jupyter Server is kind of like a, a notebook server, you can think of it as a notebook server, but it has no interface. Uh, it will run voila, so voila, render, so it changed the URL. Well, well even if you make mistakes, it still renders it. Um, and it shows you this. So and this is important, this voila render, we're gonna show that when we deploy this uh, to, uh, or try to deploy this to uh, my binder. Um, so what I want to do now is, uh, who, who here is familiar with MyBinder? Okay, who here is familiar with Git, comfortable with Git? Okay, so if you're comfortable, you can like uh, uh, go along with me. I'm gonna create a GitHub repo, push a notebook there, and then use MyBinder to take that repo, uh, basically create a virtual machine, and uh, you can execute your notebook like in, on the cloud. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna create a directory, scipy voila demo. And I'm gonna copy this notebook in it, so we're gonna start simple. Let's call it index.ipymb. <laughs> yeah. So we have a, di a directory here with just a notebook. So we're gonna uh, git init. So it's a GitHub repo. Um, add this file. A really meaningful commit message. 
and then we're gonna go to github <laughs> oh it doesn't really matter where you go uh, we're gonna say new repository so if this goes too fast it's n like uh, I'm gonna like share like the steps you need to do uh, later on repository name I'm gonna give it the same name voila uh, scipy voila demo <coughs> demo of voila at scipy <laughs> create repository then basically you need to um, copy this line git remote add origin so we're gonna do that um, and then we're gonna go to mybinder.org yeah we're gonna push it but there's something that my binder needs to know like you can give it a repo so I can I can give it this uh, oh, this URL and what what my binder will do is it will clone this repo, make a virtual machine, but it needs software because uh, it, you need to tell it like, uh, okay, what are the dependencies? We're importing IPy widgets, uh, pandas. So you need to create a requirement.txt file. Uh, I have one here and this is basically good enough for now. Are people familiar with the requirement.txt? file basically uh, uh, each line is a requirement um, and I want to be explicit about the uh, versions uh, that we need so we're going to put this at this as well and then we're going to push it okay so now my notebook and my requirement file is on uh, should soon be how is this no different way of doing this uh, upload an existing file uh, no. tutorial so we just need to upload these files Yeah, no commit, uh, no commit message, really bad practice, but uh, uh, okay, so we have this notebook here. <laughs> so let's first uh, try to just launch it. So what my binder is doing, um, and actually let me do it in parallel, um, almost what it's doing on my local machine, because sometimes my binder takes a long time, and uh, then I also know if it's, uh, uh, if you have Docker on your machine, you can in pip install Jupyter repo to Docker. I'll just leave this. And then you can run repo to Docker and that, that's basically the engine behind my binder. What it does. So I created this uh, repo and it will now create a, 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 like a virtual machine it will download, so it will take a look at this requirement file. It's downloading, installing that. So it's installing NumPy, MB convert, all the requirements. I, I bet which it's seven. Ah, it's un installing. Yes, because it should do seven five. And let's see how my bind. Well, actually, my binder was first. That's uh, that's cool. Uh, so my binder created for me a like virtual machine with uh, a Jupyter uh, a notebook running on it and I can click this like voila button 
So now this is running in the cloud. Uh, you can't give someone this URL because this is private for my virtual machine. Um, but this part of the URL we want to reuse. <laughs> because by default it will give you the notebook view. And if I want to give this to my mother, she doesn't know like what to do. I want to give her a URL and she clicks it and it just runs. So we're going to change here to URL and hit launch again. And it should be fast. So what are the requirements for the user um, to be able to use it? Nothing. So they don't need to install a blah, blah, blah. So, 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 so now, now I go back to this form. What it uh, has done here is it copy this URL below and share your my binder with others. So we're going to copy or we're going to copy this, actually, this binder badge. <laughs> we're, on this clipboard is the URL to this, um, to the link that will spin up this machine. So we're going to put in a, a readme. Um, hi, mom. Click here. <laughs> Let's see if that. So if you if you go to my repo, or if my mother goes to the, my repo GIF, or, and I, she clicks this button, she will see this, 44 not found. Okay, um, we should improve that. <coughs> and can you? Uh, so it was timing out. So, so my binder runs for like 10 minutes and then it will shut down the virtual machine. Ah, so th then, uh, so what I've said, like this link that you, that you have here, uh, so this one, this is a URL you cannot share because this is private to my virtual machine and 15 minutes from now it's going to be dead. Um, so instead, you should go to the MyBinder page and copy this link. So one of these links here. That's odd. You should show me uh, later. Yeah, Matt, can you try like running also with the? Uh, is that? You, well, just like uh, 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 make sure that it's running so I can show it later. So um, because of this SSH issue, I'm gonna start with. Um, what I wanted to do, just let me show you, is take a, a different notebook. Yeah, okay, that was confusing. Yeah, too many notebook servers running. So what I have here is a more, um, so I have a BQ plot. Uh, I attach a Futify slider to it, to the uh, bins. So it's like I can change with the slider. Some CSS issue, it's being clipped, but it's not important for uh, now. A line chart and just an observe on when the range of what when I select changes and it will update the data in this. Uh, so just a really simple like demo. Um, but something additional to uh, to this, so I can show this with voila. So let me do that. So now I have like uh, the voila view of this. So I can change this and this. Um, but still the, the layout isn't correct. I, I Actually in this case, I don't want the output cells. I want to like say, well, put this widget there and this there and like, um, and we're gonna talk about that tomorrow. We're gonna give a talk on uh, uh, Voila and uh, Futify uh, uh, tomorrow as well. Um, so I'm just gonna show you the code to do this. And what what you should pay attention to is like we add this extra like metadata, we give it some ID and we have a custom template to say, well, actually like uh, the widget with content main should go here and the widget with, uh, there are a few of these names so that you can, can place them. But it needs a custom widgets, a widget. Um, so a custom template, sorry. So what you do is you specify on the command line uh, template Futify default. 
So actually, if you uh, you can pip install that. Is it voila Futify? Yeah, pip install voila Futify to download this template. And then you can do template uh, Futify default. <laughs> yes. And what it does now, it shows a completely different layout. So this is like unrecognizable as a a Jupyter notebook. This is uh, it's responsive. So if I change, if it's wide, they're next to each other. If it's a smaller screen. They will like uh, be under each other, and actually the side sidebar or the navigation drawer on the left should, yeah, depending on the width, will show or not. So if I make it smaller, I have to like manually do this. Um, so because of this SSH issue uh, and and time, I can't like show you how to uh, uh, to do this. But what's really nice is is it running on the uh, iPad? Can you can you bring it to me? Voila, demo. So Martin, we're gonna work with uh, this <coughs> repo instead. Perfect. So and actually, because this library is also like compatible with like mobile uh, apps, so I have this repo. I navigate from my mobile phone, or in this case, an iPad. And now I can, like tabs. So this is like a modern web app, but behind it is a regular like notebook. So I think this shows the power of like what you can do with notebooks, voila, and widgets. And Martin, do you want to? Uh, so this was showing uh, like deployment with uh, MyBinder, and Martin is going to show a different way of doing that. Okay, so um, with MindBinder it's nice, but you still have the um, the Jupyter interface, the tree view, and everything. And also, it takes time to start. So if you just want to deploy the Voila application, you can use, for example, Heroku. Here, I, I deployed this application during the weekend. It's just a small um, a small example using BQplot. And it should start really fast. <laughs> Believe me, it's fast. <laughs> okay. So maybe it's the internet connection, I don't know, loading. Yeah. Voila. Um, <laughs> yeah, you have to see it. Um, so Heroku is like super nice. It's super simple to create, to deploy your, your application with it. Um, you just need to create an account. You can create a free account for this example. I created a free account and it's, it, it, it just works. You have to install Heroku on your machine. And then what you can do is, so here, I cloned uh, Martin's repo. What I need to do is create um, a requirements file. I already have it. I need my notebooks, of course. I need a proc file, which will um, contain the, the command to execute when starting the, the application. So let's create it. I 
the notebook it's full of beautify let's add some some more um options and I will use the beautiful default template like that I also need a, a runtime.txt file containing the Python version And that's it. So given that you, I will just commit those file. Given that you created an account on Heroku, you can do, and installed it on your machine, you can do Heroku create. Yeah. I do that like that. So Heroku created it created an app, limitless limitless depth. Um, now git push. So when when I did Heroku create, it it added a remote um, repo here Heroku. So I can do git push Heroku master. This will build build the app. Uh, install the requirements and everything. So it's installing Python, pip. It should install voila because I added it to the requirements. So this one can take time if you have um, a lot of requirements. It's installing it by Vutify, voila Vutify. So all those steps, I, I documented it in um, this repository on GitHub, uh, voila underscore Heroku. And you can find it's like 10 steps to deploy um, your, your application using Voila and Heroku. So now I should be able to to start it. So there is a shorthand command, Heroku open, that will open your browser to the right URL. And that's it, it works. So it took me like five minutes to deploy a Voila application on Heroku. And as you could see, it was, it was, a, it was um, faster to start than the first time. And this time you can, you can share this URL to your friends, to your mom, and it just works. So uh, I think like these steps, like how to like deploy it on my binder and Heroku, will probably go into the uh, uh, documentation for Voila. So we will put like the instructions also, like the steps we've done on the GitHub repo. So if you pull this in the future, you should be able to see that. And there's already a pull request open for adding this to the documentation. So. Um, it will be in the Voila documentation. So I think this is the end, and I think uh, like uh, of the at least instructions, and you have, uh, um, so you see it takes like five minutes to deploy to Heroku, and we have 10 minutes. So you have five minutes to make a notebook, and five minutes to deploy to Heroku, and so we'll have something like 80 uh, Heroku apps uh, 10 minutes from now. Uh, so. Or maybe we could just have a Q&A. <laughs> yeah, so I think we could, yeah, have a, um, do you want to have like a public Q&A now? Or? Are there any questions people want to ask? Oh, you, you didn't mention 
Yeah. Cool. Yeah. This. Yeah. Quickly. Quickly. Like, if you have a really nice example, uh, there's something called Voila Gallery, where we want to show some uh, some really nice examples of notebooks and uh, Voila. Um, ah, well, here it is. Yeah, so if you want to add your example to the Voila Gallery, you just open a pull request to the Voila Gallery uh, repo, adding your example in this file, gallery.yaml, but I, I think it's documented somewhere how to contribute new examples. And um, it should show up here, and when you launch, it, it uses Binder to, to start the application. So if you have uh, cool examples, please please share it. Yeah. So if people have like questions about like anything related to widgets, I think now will be a. Gonna let Matt answer that one. <laughs> Short answer: I don't think there is. Short answer is his IPy events package is the way to do oh, it. Oh, <laughs> well, no, what, so, so, so a couple of navigation things. What, what one that that it, useful to be aware of for accessibility reasons. Um, so you can tab between controls, which helps somewhat, and uh, some grid layouts, if they rearrange the order that things are displayed, they do not change the tab order. So okay. you can end up tabbing in a very strange order. Um, if you want to capture DOM events generally, there's a package called IPy events that um, you can point one of those widgets at a, a widget like an image um, and then capture any DOM events like clicks or mouse movement or that kind of thing that happen over the widget. And also, um, uh, what we, where we're going to go, want to go with uh, with voila and uh, like the template system, is that there's also a point where you say like maybe I should work together with a web dev, uh, developer now, and that's where we want to go with voila. So creating a custom template for, uh, uh, the, where a web developer helps you, and they basically say, well, um, you create a widget with a particular name, and I'm going to put it here. And so it's easy to work uh, together. And then I think a uh, web developer should be able to do this more easily. Yeah. yeah. Um, so the question is, what is the key component in a physical controller like this? that makes it interactive. And the key for this controller is that it speaks the MIDI protocol. And so there's a defined standard for uh, messages going in and out of this keyboard, or, or this, this controller, to the browser. And Chrome implements the web MIDI standard, so it, Chrome can speak to this uh, controller. Um, and there's other MIDI controllers as well. In fact, uh, an exciting thing is that they, they just uh, announced like an RC essentially, I think, of the MIDI 2.0 standard. And a lot of people are going to come out with new controllers based on this 2.0 standard. So it'll be pretty exciting in the next year or two. Um, but yeah, the MIDI controller is the keyword to, to look for here. And, uh, and then the other physical controller we support is the game controller. So anything that supports sort of a standard game controller, like an Xbox game controller or, or you know, you can buy a, a cheap game controller off of Amazon or something. Um, those work as well. What? Oh, MIDI is M-I-D-I. -I. Yep. And this one in particular, it, it's pretty specific to the actual controller you buy. This one is the Behringer X-Touch Mini. So, thanks. So, notebooks are uh, remote code execution applications. Are Voila apps safe to deploy? Um, yes, they should be. So, kind of the, the model of the notebook is your, like, your notebook, your code is, is kind of living in the browser, right? And you send it 
uh, towards the server and that will send it to the kernel. With voila, uh, the notebook is only known at the server. Um, so it will execute the, the code that's at the server and it will never accept any code execution coming from the browser. It will actually block that. <coughs> so the idea behind voila is keep the notebook and the execution part on the server but still allow the communication and the communication can trigger like callbacks that will execute code but your code so you're responsible uh, responsible for making it safe because you can make a text box which will execute that code and then it will probably not be safe but yeah the the, the idea behind it uh, it's safe and you sh you don't see the code so the code is also invisible So I, I think you, uh, you, you <laughs> GitHub won't let you upload it. <laughs> ah, yeah, no, so it doesn't work. No, so the idea is that you deploy um, Voila or Jupyter Server, so you run it next to the data, and you run your no uh, notebook next to the data. I think that, uh, so I wouldn't, you, you can use my binder. You can create your own my binder and, and make sure that the, the, the machine it's using, so if it's in, on AWS, that it's using a machine that's close to the data. Yeah. So, um, j jokes about file size aside, my binder has an upper limit on the amount of file size you can use, but last fall I was doing an astronomy class with some undergraduates and I had 10 of them at a time, each copying six gigabytes of data from one of my servers to binder and binder didn't complain. Yeah, so, so what I've shown, like uh, uh, FEX is an example where uh, the, the library kind of reduces the uh, a huge amount of data um, to like uh, histograms or statistics, and dimensional statistics, and show that like as image. So you basically do the aggregation at the server, and at the client you show like a, uh, a reduced version of that. So I think there's kind of an, an upper limit of, for say a scatter plot, you would say the upper limit is of like um, 100,000 or a million points that you can visualize in uh, say BQ plot. Um, I think plotly as well. But uh, if you go above that, it's also kind of meaningless because you you don't see anything anymore. So you need to do some aggregation, like what Fex is doing or Data Shader, built on top of Bokeh, does also something similar. So it's basically aggregating the data and sending smaller versions to the front end. It depends on the problem. So, uh, uh, so uh, yeah. So the question was, um, uh, yeah, which which package is, uh, is faster for like uh, uh, big data to uh, to visualize? Um, it it depends. Um, what I try to do with VEX, I'll give a talk tomorrow on VEX, um, which is like a data frame library that tries to reduce the data, but not give the final answer to the visualization. That's something you can push into Matplotlib. So you can aggregate like a billion points to a histogram of 10 bins and show that. And that's something that Fex can do quite, can do in a second. Um, if you do two grid, uh, 2D grid, uh, visualization, a data shader is also an option. Um, and otherwise, if you want to have something custom, you can take a look at um, uh, Dask data frame, mode in, um, yeah, for large data frames, that's, I think these are the options. I think we have time for one more quick question before lunch. Or we now have time for lunch. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.